lesson is about polynomial functions, and what we're going to try to do within this lesson is help you learn how to tell what the basic shape of a function is from looking at the equation, as well as to talk more about where they cross the x-axis and what the zeros are. First of all, you can learn really a lot from the leading coefficient and degree of a polynomial. When the polynomial is lined up in standard order, and standard order means that the powers are going down, then you want to look at the first term. So here we have 4, 3, and 1. So all of these four examples are lined up in standard order, and the powers are going down. So what we're going to do is consider two things. Is the leading coefficient positive or negative? The leading coefficient is your big number that's in front of your term with the highest power. And then is the degree on that particular term even or odd? So is it positive or negative, and is it even or odd? Now, how does that work for us? Well, this is really the summary information, so you might want to take a screenshot or a snapshot of this page. But if the leading coefficient is positive, the right-hand part of the graph is headed up. If the leading coefficient is negative, then I know that right-hand end of it is headed down. And what even and odd tells me is whether or not the ends are headed the same direction. If it's even, they are headed the same direction. And if it's odd, they're headed different directions. Okay, so really we can kind of summarize that in this little chart here. It's a little bit blurry. I've, that's in your online textbook. But you have two options. Either your leading coefficient is positive or it's negative. The positive one tells me this right-hand side is headed up, whereas the negative tells me the right-hand side is headed down. And even lets me know if the other side, that left-hand side, is headed the same direction or the opposite direction. These are the exact same four that we had on that very first screen. By the way, the little, like, zigzags in here are because we're not saying anything about how many terms there are right now. We're only talking about the end behavior. When we look at this, then we just look at this leading term, and what I see is that this is a positive number and it's even. Since it's positive, I know that right hand is headed up, and since it's even, I know that the other side is headed the same direction. I don't know anything about what's in the middle. Moving to the right then, I have a negative and I have an odd. Negative means the right hand is headed down and odd means the other side is going the opposite direction. Again, I don't know what's in the middle. A positive odd. Positive, the right hand is headed up. Odd means the left hand is going the opposite way. Negative even. Negative means the right hand is headed down. The even means that the left hand is going the same direction. So we learn about end behavior. What is happening on the ends from just looking at that first term. Now additionally, we take that very first term and we look at the power on it, the ones we were just saying were even and odd. And by basis of the power, we can name the polynomial. Now, I think the first three you're really probably familiar with by now, for sure, constant, linear, and quadratic. If something is raised to the third power, it is cubic. And in all honesty, nobody I know uses the term quartic. There are terms all the way up. So like if it was in the fifth degree, it's a quintic polynomial and so on. But generally, nobody uses those. However, you will need to in your homework this time. It does go up to quartic in your homework. So these are instructions like you'll find in your homework. Find the leading term, the leading coefficient, and the degree. Now, do be aware, because they're asking you to find the leading term, they're not necessarily lined up in order. So the leading term would be the one that, we're, that would be in front if we lined it up with the highest power first. So you're looking for the highest power. So my leading term here, we're just going to highlight the leading term on all of these. So the leading term is this one. It's got the highest power. On our next one, though, 
okay, it's this one because that's the one that has the highest power. It's just not lined up in the standard order. This is my only term, so it must be the leading term. And here, this one with the X is a leading term. So we've identified the leading term. The leading coefficient, and we're going to mark our leading coefficient. I'm saving myself a little bit of writing here. We're going to put red parentheses around it. So the leading coefficient is your uh, big number that's out in front of your leading term. So and do include any signs with it. So it's a positive 1 half. It's a positive 0 0.11. It is the negative 6. And by the way, even though it's not here, it's like this one has an x to the 0 because anything raised to the 0 is 1. So that's why you don't see it. And then here, the leading coefficient is 0.9. Now, the degree of the polynomial. We're going to take our little magic pen that changes along the way here, and we're going to circle the degree. So this one is cubed. This one is to the fourth. This one is this zero that actually didn't show up. And here we have a one, and that one was also understood and not written. Classify the function as constant, linear, quadratic, cubic, or quartic. Okay, since this one had a 3, this one is cubic. The 4 is quartic. The 0 is constant. And then this one that's had that understood first degree is linear. So you will have homework. Unfortunately, you won't be able to just highlight it and put parentheses around there. You'll have a blank for each one of those where you have to list them all out, okay, or put commas in between them. But you have some problems just exactly like that. The next thing within this lesson is about zeros. If a function is equal to zero for a particular value, then that value is called a zero. And the easiest way to find this is use the table feature of your calculator, because anytime you need to plug in multiple numbers, the table feature is generally the way to go. Bringing up our calculator, I'll get it down here a little bit lower so that we can still see it at the same time. What I want to do is go to y equals, and I want to type in that polynomial. So I have x to the third minus 9x squared plus 14x plus 24. So now I've typed it in and I'm going to go to my table feature. That is under second graph. I have mine already set where I can just type in numbers, but if you have like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 here, then you're going to need to reset it. I always like to tell people where to find that. So that's under table set, which is second window. And what you want to do is make sure you're independent doesn't matter about the rest of it. Just go down to this independent and make sure you put it on ask. That is what lets you type in values into your table. The values I'm wanting to type in are 4, 5, and negative 2. And I don't scroll around to see if they're in there. I just go ahead and type them because I can type over it. So 4, 5, and negative 2. And what I find is that 4 is a 0. That's the one that made it equal 0. So 4 is a 0. The other two are not because they made it equal negative 6 and negative 48. F of 4 was 0. When I plugged in a 5, I got negative 6. And when I plugged in a negative 2, I got negative 48. This one then is a 0. 4 is a 0. The 5 and the negative 2 are not. So if you just need to use substitution to determine if it's a 0, you're just going to plug it in and see if it equals 0. Sometimes a 0 can occur more than once. It's not going to show you that when you're just using substitution, but you can see that by repeated factors. And then we refer to the number of times a factor repeats as its multiplicity.
And the multiplicity is important, particularly whether or not that multiplicity is even and odd. We don't want to go too far into that right now. But find the zeros and state the multiplicity. Now, you'll notice that all of these are entirely factored. That's not going to be the case for you, okay? So we've practiced some factoring before. If you need help, let me know. But you are expected to be able to factor some of them. And then once it's factored, then you can find the zeros and state the multiplicity. So the zero is what makes that particular factor equal zero. So here, the zero here is negative three. But the multiplicity is how many times that factor occurs. So it occurred twice. So this one has a multiplicity of two. The next zero in that particular problem is a one. That factor only occurs once, so it had a multiplicity of one. Now, the reason we're interested in this is later, as we put together more of our concepts, even multiplicities indicate that the graph bumps the x-axis at that point, but doesn't cross it. And an odd multiplicity means that it crosses the x-axis at that point. But we'll deal more with that later. My very first zero is negative 5. Negative 5 has a multiplicity of 3, and I see that from that exponent there. The next zero is 4. It only has a multiplicity of 1. And then my last zero is negative 1. Negative 1 has a multiplicity of 2. Looking at this last one then, I've got a lot of things lined out. The negative 2 out here, there's no x involved. It doesn't relate to the 0 at all. So we're moving into this one, something that can make it equal 0. So I get a 4 with a multiplicity of, and be careful. In this case, there's no exponent written, but I can see that this occurs 1, 2, 3 times. So even though it wasn't written with an exponent, the multiplicity is 3. And then my next 0 is negative 6 multiplicity of 1. Again, because you will need to factor some things, you might need to review some factoring. You can find our lesson. You can look in your online textbook. You know, or don't hesitate to check out a YouTube video or look something up online if you need help with factoring. You can use your graphing calculator to help you approximate the zeros. I'm going to type that in and then I'll make it bigger so that you can see the calculator a little bit better. So I have x to the third plus 3x squared minus 9x minus 13. How do we use our calculator to find the zeros, especially to decimal places? Because if I could hit graph, but that's not going to really show you to decimal places where it is, not yet. So what we want to do is tell it to calculate for me. Okay, calculate is second trace. And you can tell it to calculate a zero. Now, why wouldn't we always do this? Because sometimes it does round. Your calculator is not as precise as just cranking out the algebra, although it's incredibly good and it can get lots of details. So even though I can't see the entire graph on here, I do see where it crosses the axis. And I can even see it clearly enough to tell that that's not going to be in an integer. So I want it to find these values for me to decimal values. So I'm going to repeat the exact same process three times. I want it to calculate that zero. I've already said that. Notice it says left bound. So even though I don't see a cursor anywhere on here, it's telling me that the cursor is at the value of x equals zero. So it's down here somewhere in this area off my screen. I want to hit this left arrow key until I get that to the left of that very first zero. Doesn't matter if you're above or below, you just have to be to the left. So that seems like a good left bound to me. What you're essentially doing is giving your calculator two values to look between. Now, I want to use my right arrow key until I get to the right of that. Doesn't matter how far, so I can hit enter. So now I'm telling my calculator, I know it's between these two lines. And if you have a calculator that doesn't show the lines, it'll still show those little triangles there. So it's between those. You don't have to waste any time on the guess. That doesn't really save your calculator much. And so we hit enter, and notice it tells me that it, the zero is at negative 4.377552. So now let's break this back down a little bit. 
and it says to three decimal places. So that's going to be negative 4.378. And that is the leftmost one. And as I recall, I think your homework asks you to, to list them from least to greatest or starting with the zero on the left. So I've done that, but now I need to find my next zero. So I'm going to repeat this process. You can watch it again. So I need it to calculate. So that is second trace. I want it to calculate a zero. That was option two. It gives me a left bound, but I'm no longer, I am to the left of the one I want, but you don't want to be way over. You want to be fairly close, but just to the left of what you want. Okay, so now I'm above it, but I'm to the left of, of this point that I'm interested in. So I hit enter, and then I get to the right. And what should always happen is when you're looking for a zero, one of them is going to be above the line, and one of them is going to be below the line in general. So now I've got my two lines, hit enter, and my next zero is at negative 1.167. All right, we've got one more to find. So I'm going to go second trace, which is my calculate. Choose option two for a zero. I want to be to the left of this point, so I'm going to hit my right arrow key until my cursor is somewhere right in that area. All right, so I'm below it, but I'm to the left of it. Enter. Keep going a little further. Now I'm to the right of it. So I've given my calculator this really narrow field to look between and say, I know there's a zero somewhere in there. And it's at 2.545.